Hello and welcome to our ongoing series of compliance webinars presented by Mango. It's good to be back in New Zealand and back on the, into these webinars. I travelled a lot in August visiting some potential customers of Mango in Australia, South Africa and the United Kingdom. And the key thing I learned on the trip is that companies are still struggling with the amount of QHSE compliance and they're really not spending a lot of time on continuous improvement. So thank you to the hundreds viewing the live event now and a big hello to those thousands that will be listening and viewing this webinar in their own time. I know that time is important to you all and I'm grateful for you all to view this. My name's Craig Thornton, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Mango. Uh, before we get into the webinar proper with our panellists, I have some an, an exciting announcement. Because Mango is growing, going through some growing pains, we've decided to implement a formal quality system to manage our growth. So at the same time, we're setting up the system to achieve ISO 9001 certification. So as we go through setting up our quality system here at Mango, I'll be blogging about how we, do, how we go about setting it up and how we achieve ISO 9001 certification. So if you have time, jump onto the Mango website, check out the blog and subscribe to our blog. Uh, the, if you subscribe, you'll receive an auto email when I send up, put up new posts on the blog. I'll be posting updates at least weekly. And the first two blogs are up on the website now and you can read them in your own time. So right on to the webinar now, just some housekeeping rules. Please ask lots of questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar application. During the presentation, our panelists will answer those questions for you. Secondly, I'll be recording this webinar and soon after I'll send you all a link to the presentation. This will be a video plus all the slides. You're most welcome to share the presentation with your colleagues. Uh, I know these webinars get shared with all sorts of groups. And finally, I've arranged the next webinar. That webinar will be on key performance indicators. There's always been plenty of discussion around that topic and that's been going for many years. So that'll be a good one. So on to today's topic. Our panelist today is Ian Hendra from Clearline Services. Ian has a vast knowledge in quality management, risk management, food safety, and generally compliance. Uh, Ian shared me this presentation last night, and I noted that Ian started internal auditing in 1977, so that's 39 years. Um, he's been on all sides of the compliance game. He's been a CEO of a compliance body. Uh, he's been on standards committees. He's been a quality manager. He's written many articles for New Zealand organisations for Quality's Q News. And now he's a sought after quality consultant. He is always thought provoking and challenges conventional thinking around QHSE. Ian has some really interesting thoughts on internal auditing to share with you today. He may, uh, he may even change your belief systems around internal auditing. So Ian, welcome and over to your presentation. Go for it. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Um, good lunchtime, everybody. It's, it's lunchtime here. I don't know what time of day it is where you're listening from, but I hope you're all having a good day. Let's, let's get into this uh, right now. Um, so here I'm Ian Hendra from Clearline Services. I've been around a few years. Um, what's happened here, Craig? Go to the next slide. Here we go. Here we go. That's it. Okay, this presentation is for you um, if you're struggling with internal auditing. I've, I've been doing internal auditing a very, very long time, uh, and I've struggled with it since day one. Um, still struggle with it now. Well, not quite as much as I used to. So. I'm going to cover three things basically. I'm going to tell you, going to share some history according to me anyway. I'm going to try and explain to you what I think is wrong with the conventional approach and I'm going to come up with a better way because there's no point in grumbling about anything if you can't think of a better way to do it. <clears throat> brought my kids up that way and it ends up biting you in the bum, ladies and gentlemen, but never mind. Um, here we go. Um, Food safety is, a, is, a, is something I got into only quite recently. Um, back in the days when I earned an honest living before I got into quality systems and auditing, I was a radiological engineer. I spent my life uh, working with diagnostic x-ray equipment in hospitals. Now, this, and, I, and I ended up at 30 years of age working for this outfit here. Now, this is, um, you, uh, listeners from Britain might get hold of this. Um, 
This is the Department of Health and Social Security, DHSS, National Health Service Procurement Directorate, which was killed off by Margaret Thatcher, um, and the Scientific and Technical Branch, Group 6A. Now, Group 6A was the radiological section, and our role in those days was to serve as the consultancy agency that supplied the whole of the UK National Health Service with new X-ray equipment. When I joined that outfit in 1976, the budget was £40 million a year for new X-ray equipment and £40 million a year for X-ray film. And we were responsible for the disposition of those funds. Now, what we did was to, we had big contracts with all the, all the major suppliers, suppliers all across the world, at GE, Philips, Siemens, uh, Kodak, everybody, all the big companies. Um, and we bought gear from them in huge quantities. We were the largest single buyer of X-ray equipment in the world by a country mile. And we used to, so when the installations were installed, we used to audit them. And when they were satisfactorily audited, they, the, the, the supplier got paid the final 5% retention. Now, I, there were five of us covering the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, there were 15 regions in the health service in those days each. Uh, with a population of three or four million people, and we all, the five of us, had three regions each. Now, what's interesting about that is in those days, one regional health service, one regional health service in the UK was about the same size as the whole of the New Zealand health service now. Um, over those seven years, I did a thousand installations audits, and it was between 1977 and 1984. Those dates are important because that is the time when the world woke up to the fact that quality was rubbish, uh, certainly to in Britain. For example, in those days, I could walk into an x-ray department, and if I knew who the engineer was, I could write the grumble list before I opened my tool case. knew exactly what I was going to find wrong. And that went on for years. We got fed up with that, and on the 14th of May, 1984, yes, that's as that long ago as that, I did my management and quality systems auditing course, um, which lasted, would you believe, 52 hours. It was 52 hours in a week. It wasn't the sort of three-day magic wonder that it is these days. It was 52 hours. It started at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning and finished 52 hours later, uh, 52 working hours later, late on the Friday of that week. <laughs> the two guys that ran it, this is important, these guys were ex-Ministry of Defence, or they were Ministry of Defence. Ministry of Defence started all this. Don't, don't let anybody kid you that it came from anywhere else. ISO 9001 is and always was a supplier selection criterion for defence contractors. That's what it is, and it still is, as far as I can see. Uh, NATO is the, is the biggest user of the standard, and the standard is, um, is still applicable in NATO procurement contracts, just as it was then. So that's who these guys were about, and what was it all about? Well, we got fed up with all this inspection stuff, so we invented a scheme that was based on the uh, NATO, on, on the defence system, and we set up a thing called the DHSS Good Manufacturing Guides to BS 5750-1979 Part 2. Um, now, the, these stand, this, this standard was effectively the, the defence standard. Um, and right at the start of this 52-day course, so it's like, oh, hang on, let me just step back a minute. We, we went, so we went from inspecting installations to doing audits on suppliers. So we went from the delivery end of the contract to the procurement end of the contract. And this is how I switched from inspecting installations to auditing companies. Right? Now, this statement here is quality assurance equals effective management was the first slide put up on the audit course, the 52-hour course. And I reckon it got slammed into us once an hour for the, each of those 52 hours during that week. Very, very hard week. Thoroughly enjoyed every second of it. What's intriguing in this story to you guys now is this is there was not one single solitary word in any minute of those 52 hours about internal auditing. It did not exist. 
cut a long story short, the standard came from a NATO committee called AC250 that started out in 1955 and it had a techn tactical problem. The tactical problem it tried to was addressing was how to select suppliers when the Russian, this is the Cold War, when the Russian Navy had blockaded the Atlantic. So if you wanted a new suspension part for your American jet fighter, how did you get somebody in France to make it? Because you couldn't get it from America. And that was the tactical issue that, that led to working out that quality has to be designed in from the start, you can't inspect it in later. And you can't order it in later for that matter, I'd say too. And that's another big problem that's, gets, that's got, got lost in the, in the wash since. So these standards appeared and they were called the Allied Quality Assurance Procedures, AQAPs. Um, in the UK, very quickly they became the Defence Standards 0520 series, but they applied to individual contracts at three levels. There was, and those familiar with 9001, 9002, 9003 will get this. The first level was all about design, production and supply. The second level was production and supply. And the third level was supply only. Now, there are relatively few design people. This was defense, so you, you didn't, you know, there only, you only bought a few whole airplanes and ships and navigation systems and radar systems. But there were millions, thousands of subcontractors, so there, were, there weren't many of these certifications. There were thousands of these and almost none of these because nobody particularly cared about the stockists, to be honest. And not one single word about internal auditing. Not a single word. In 1979, those defence standards became BS 5750 because the the guy who'd set it up at the Ministry of Defence became Director General of BSI. That's that's the way it happened. In 1984, we saw the, the advent of the UK National Quality Camp. This not quality campaign. This, guys, is very, very important because this is why all of us listening to this webinar do what we do. This is where it came from, the UK National Quality Campaign in 1984. It was never repeated anywhere else at this level, anywhere in the world. Um, it came from a, a Department of Trade white paper that grumbled about quality of British products. And it had five elements. It set up BS 5750 as the standard that will sort out lousy quality. This is interesting. It set up a register of consultants who would tell people how to implement this system. Craig, you want to find some of these guys? <laughs> uh, yeah. I know a few of them. They're a bit older than me. <coughs> Excuse me a minute. <coughs> um, they're, they're, they're a massive budget, huge budget for consultancy grants, so you could, companies could get certified. You could get a grant for two-thirds the cost of 15 days consultancy if you achieved a registration that is standard. Two-thirds the cost of 15 days consultancy, right? Now, if you want to know where the signposted quality manual, what I call the 15-day quality manual came from, this is where it came from, because the government paid for it. They enabled an external certification service um, and they set up accreditation bodies. Now, the accreditation bodies were there to do two things. Firstly, to keep the standards level in the in level of playing field for certification, but secondly, to get around the conflict of interest that existed because the, the fees for the certification body came from the government grants that were being dished out to companies wanting to get certified. So a, they called it conflict of interest. Um, and that's why these days it still persists that certification bodies aren't allowed to advise on quality systems or systems they certify. And that's where it comes from. Uh, whether you think it's right, wrong, or indifferent, and I can I can see arguments that, 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 that are counter to the current view, certainly. But that's where it comes from. It's all about protecting this huge billions of dollar of pounds that the Department of Trade let you let loose for, for, for ten years in the, in the 1980s. Still not one single word about internal auditing. I have no to add in any of this. In 1988, I joined one of these accredited CB thingamajiggies as their first quality manager. Um, when I joined in 1988, there were, they had 30 certificates, 1,500 more over the next three years. That was the hardest I have ever worked in my entire life. Um, I used to work 12, 14 hours a day, every day, six days a week. 
uh, because I was the quality manager too, but I had to do my five days a week chargeable. So I was five days a week chargeable out there doing audits and did the quality management stuff on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, it was a great time, but it nearly killed me, it nearly cost me a marriage actually, but there you go. In 1987, we got this ISO 9000, the 1, 2, and 3 appeared. Uh, they were almost identical, the 5750, 50, um, but it had included, or, included this internal audit thing, and everybody went, what's that? What on earth is this internal audit thing? Good Lord. Um, so it came from anyway. nowhere. It came from nowhere. It, it, it came from nowhere. If you if you dismantle BS 5750 1979 into the standards that were existing at the time, you you end up inevitably back to three beautiful pieces of work produced by the BSI, and they were called handbooks 22, 23, 24, 25, and they were 2,000 pages, double-sided A4, two columns of standards that all related to quality assurance systems of some kind or other, including costing. Right, including the financial side. There were sampling standards and all sorts of standards about how to do everything. The bit that was missing was internal audit. You could do a word search on it right now and not find the expression internal audit anywhere in any one of those 2000 day foresight pages. was not there. But yet it appeared, it flopped out as called 417 in ISO 9001 um, and it, nobody knew what it meant. What disappeared at roughly the same time was a clause called Final Inspection and Test. And the Final Inspection and Test clause said, a supplier shall carry out final inspections and tests to ensure that to all the tests that have been done have been done and that the results are satisfactory. Now, I think there's a big loss of that. So that, that was really what, now, and nowadays, of course, you could use internal audit to do that. People think it's new, uh, but there you go. Anyway, let's, okay, we'll, let's rush on. Now, my problem was that in 1988, when I joined this uh, CB, I had to suss out this internal audit thing for my CB and develop some kind of way of auditing. What did I do? What everybody else did, guys, I'm not genius. Um, we only knew about external contractor assessment. We'd just done these 52-hour courses, all of us, and we did this stuff every day. We knew what auditing was. Of course we did. So we stuck to our knitting, and we tuned up the external auditor assessment system for internal audit. The problem we all missed is that it's a different problem, a completely different problem. You're answering when you're doing external contractor assessments and when you're doing internal audit. The client is different and the client has different expectations. And it took me 20 years to realise that. ISO 9001, 19,011 appeared eventually, but it merely confounded, compounded the felony. What's that standard? And it, and it really, ISO 19,011, which is the standard on, on internal and external auditing, it's referred to in 9001, has been for years. But what it basically does is to regurgitate this uh, external contractor thing. And the, and the approach that hasn't changed is, is the question and answer, and I call it the don't lie, show me approach. But I mean, external auditing inevitably demands that because you're working on behalf of a, of a customer. <coughs> but that's not a rational question for an internal audit. And so the, the whole don't lie, show me thing sets up an adversarial relationship generally speaking. People try very hard to, 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 to quiet it all down. And I do it too. I've done it for years. I, I, I play right back. I'm right on the back foot with this. Don't lie. I'm very gentle with it. But it's still there. And, and don't lie, show me is basically how you do an external audit. Um, anyway, moving on. Just very briefly, where else does an internal audit appear? Well, you won't find internal audit in Lean Six Sigma, except as a way for the people who do the work to better lay out a workplace. It doesn't appear in business excellence, Baldridge, or any of that. It doesn't appear in zero defect. <coughs> in quality is free, Phil Crosby says, few functions are spoken about more and understood less than, in, than auditing. Is often the last refuge for those who really don't know how to run a prevention orientated life. Wow. <laughs> Gee. 
In TQM, Dr. Deming didn't mention it at any point in his four-day course. Why is that significant? Because if in New Zealand here in particular, if you look out into the car park, you find nearly every car is Japanese. That's because of Dr. Deming's quality systems that didn't mention a single word about Internet. Yeah, just pause there, Ian. This was... Key, this was a key understanding when you mentioned this on LinkedIn, where you said internal auditing wasn't mentioned by uh, Dr. Deming, and I thought, oh, that that stopped me in my tracks, and I sort of went back through Deming and looked at some of his stuff, and you're right, it's like um, it's in none of his 14 ma yeah. principles of management, and and um, I think you even mentioned it later around that, so um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Why, why are we doing this internal auditing game when we exactly really... Exactly right. I have a, uh, Craig, I have a book here which is actually a, if you like, it's a, it's a word for word uh, replay, very nicely written, of his four day course, of Dr. Deming's four day course that changed the world, of course, as you know, um, in Japan certainly. And, and there, it's not there, it just there isn't a single word about it. Hmm. Also, Dr. Duran, Dr. Joseph Duran's tome, I call it, the Quality Control Handbook, you know, the 1,500-page doorstop. There's nothing in there either, uh, nothing in there at all. Uh, but, well, there is a few pages, but it's, it's, it doesn't say anything about internal audit. It doesn't place any weight on internal audit at all. What it does place weight on is, right, as I said, right at the start of this presentation, Quality assurance equals effective management. Hmm. So here's Deming. Let's get into Deming. Deming invented the, the Plan Do Check Act, or he told it Plan Do Check Act. It came from Walter Schuhart's cycle of continual improvement. Deming was uh, left right hand, uh, Schuhart's uh, right hand man um, in, in the 1930s. In a book called Out of the Crisis, where Deming described how his, his interventions in Japan and how he turned the, the national economy around, he talks about these 14 points for the transformation of management. And he promulgated them once he was discovered in the West. This is interesting up here. Dr. Deming was born in 1900 and he died of cancer in 1993. He wasn't discovered in the West until 1984. He was 84 years old, <laughs> so he was only with us in the West for nine years. So you think, I'm past it, mate? You haven't seen nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> right, 14 points for the transformation of management. And this, these 14 points are the core of Japanese success in quality assurance. Okay, the problem with internal audit as we see it, as we do it with this current, like all the conventional, uh, don't lie, show me approach, is that, that first of all, it's, it's point number three, Dr. Deming says, is um, cease dependence upon inspection, build quality into the product in the first place. You can't order it in either. Well, the AC250 came to that view too. Um, in completely in parallel. Nobody in 1955 who was a member of AC250 at NATO had the foggiest idea who Dr. Deming was. Um, point number five, it says improve constantly and forever the system of production and service, not just at defined intervals, guys. You do this all the time. Drive out fear so that everyone may work effectively. Now, my reading of, of internal audit in many of the thousands of companies I've audited, I have to, by the way, one thing I didn't tell you. Um, I have served 2,000 days as an ISO 9001 auditor all over the world. I count the days in my diary, and it's about 2,000 over a period of 20 years or so. It's about 100 days a year on average for 20 years. So I can tell you that this drive out fear thing is significant. Many of the companies that I have, most of them, but not all of them, regard internal audit with kind of fear and trembling. They're very uncomfortable about it. The point is that confrontation is completely pointless. You don't do many audits of any kind before you realize that you only learn what the auditee tells you. So if the auditee is frightened of you, they don't tell you anything. 
Hmm. Point number nine, break down barriers between departments. People must work as a team to foresee problems. So having departments audit each other is totally counterproductive. It completely misses the point. Right? If you want to have departments working together, then have departments working together as improvement teams. Don't set one to audit the other, for God's sake. <coughs> Completely misses the point. Point number 10, remove barriers that rob workers of pride in workmanship. So don't have internal auditors second guessing them then. It's not nice, it's not polite for a start. Point number 11, remove barriers that rob people in management of their right to pride in workmanship. So don't have internal auditors second guessing them either. Why, why do we do this? Why do we issue us? Why do we beat ourselves up like this? Instead, as Dr. Deming says, substitute leadership and a vigorous program of education and self-improvement for everyone. Now, one way to do that is to establish properly resourced cross-functional teams to break down silos. And I have the pleasure at the moment of working for one organisation who does that absolutely beautifully. And we struggle with internal audit. <laughs> right, let's get back to the basics. Uh, we're talking about ISO 9001. This is the 2015 iteration. Oh, 9.2 internal audit. Who wrote that? Oh, here we go. Clause 9.2 internal audit. Yes, it is. Clause 9.2. Yes, they've changed the numbering for some reason in 2015. The Annex SL. Anybody understand what Annex SL is? Doesn't matter. <laughs> No. Um, <laughs> um, right. This is what this, this has remained unchanged uh, certainly since I said 2001, 2000, 17 years ago. So the organisation shall conduct internal audits at planned intervals. Now, what's a planned interval? A planned interval is a period uh, is a, um, a period of time that, in my mind, um, stretches from uh, now to never. Um, so if you wanted to start beating up about seeing planned interval, you can turn around and say never, uh, and that's a planned interval. We'll never get to it. It's a, it's a hard fight and you don't win, but it's a good, good argument. It wastes time in the audit. I've tried it. <laughs> <coughs> right, so what you do is you set the planned intervals up. Um, so you, determine, you get management to determine the intervals, but they can be variable. They don't have to be fixed. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. There are three things you need to do. The first thing you need to do is to audit that the organization conforms to its own requirements for its quality management system. Yes, strange, strange requirement that audit conforms. Yeah, it's a bit late. If you have to audit conformity with that, it's all a bit late, it seems to me. You should be working in conformance from the instant you pick up your pen on, or your spanner or your whatever it is, the moment you work into the place, you shouldn't sort of let it drift around until somebody comes along and says, oh, you're not complying. Anyway, so it conforms to the organization's own requirements and the requirements of this international standard. Uh, in fact, as I will summarize later, maintaining conformity with the management system is probably management's first and most important role. Management only has two things to do, in my view. One is to conform to the system, and the second is to deploy resources. Could probably the other way around. They have to deploy the resources, that's money and people, and conform to the system to produce the goods they're expected to produce. That's it, management in a nutshell. Um, so auditing, conformity, a bit late, really. Anyway, standard requires it. And the second bit is to audit that the system is effectively implemented and maintained. Yeah, don't you do that, Mr. Manager, continually? A bit late, again in the piece, if you find six months down the track, oh, all that work we've been doing for the last six months, uh, uh, our system doesn't work, guys, our system, we haven't been following our system. You know all those complaints we're getting, but well, it's not that surprising, is it? Anyway, that's me being sceptical. Right, three processes that might be a bit novel, and this is, this is the new bit. Right. 
First of all, you use audit as a tool, so you require managers to commission investigations to validate conformity in areas where they have concerns. Uh, this is converting internal audit into a tool that managers use to help them. Not that they have to do, not a tool, not a thing that beats them up on a regular basis because they have to. And the way to do that is to put on, on standard agenda on team meetings, management meetings, for example, the standard agenda item that says, is there anything worrying us that in which do, do, for doing an audit on would help to resolve? Right. Point number one. Point number two, and this is the one that gets um, this bit, it does actually, you get a real neat combination of these two together. And this is, now I do this religiously <coughs> in my systems, um, and I set up a thing I call a dime matrix versus the standard, with, and I put an annual audit check just to make sure it's still current. Now dime, I'll tell you what, tell you what dime is in a minute, all right? Uh, next bit, and then for the, this one, it's effectively implemented and maintained. You use cross-functional team-based brainstorming tools from the Memory Jogger 2 within routine process product and project review procedures. And I'll show you what that means too. Now this really works. This is brilliant. And you'll love the last slides, a last couple of slides on this. You really will. I hope, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, here we go. Now, a dime matrix is an exposition of conformity. That's the terminology I use from the aviation industry where having to produce an exposition of conformity is necessary to get an operating license, whether you want to be an air traffic control service, whether you want to build airplanes, whether you want to run an airline. There's a set of rules that you have to meet established by the local civil aviation authority. And in New Zealand anyway, you have to produce an exposition of conformity against those rules that the civil aviation regulator reviews before they even come on site and do an audit on you to make sure you're complying with those rules. So there you go. Um, now what is this exposition? So how does it work? Here we go. Well, it's a big matrix, strangely enough. That's why it's called a dime matrix. Um, and there's only one, either, so there's rows and columns. Now there's one item of conformity per row. If you break down ISO 9001, 2008, there are 224 items of conformity. And breaching any one of which, of course, is counter to your claim to comply to the whole lot. The matrix only uses the standards, words in the standard. So I'm, I'm going to say this now. Do not change the words in the script. the words in the Don't ent introduce extra words into the standard. That's Tiger Country. You can certainly invert the, sen invert the sentences from statements into questions by reversing the noun and the verb, but we all learn how to do that at school. Um, the, the, the matrix consists of seven columns. Right. Here we go. There's a row number, there's the item, which is the question. Then you, then you have these, these five columns. The first column is, where is this, where do we document that we address this item? How do we implement that we address this item? Who's monitoring or what's monitoring that we're complying with this item? And where's the evidence? And the column right over on the right is a note for auditing or whatnot. Now, next slide is an example of one that I use regularly. And the other point is, of course, as you'll see in the example, that every row becomes a documented procedure in its own right. And that's one that catches up. Auditors, uh, can you can you see this, guys? Yes, I think so. So dime dime means documented, implemented, monitored, yep. effective. Is that yep. right? Or evidence? Effective or evidence? Effective, effective or evidence? Ah, okay. Yeah, evidence evidence of effectiveness. Right. Now, <coughs> on this particular extract, in this one, I've got the, 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 the I've got a header on each page that says. Um, describes what I mean in each of those boxes, and I've got a colour code which I call RAG, red, amber, green. I'm an engineer, so everybody needs a RAG. Um, so red means um, uh, the, the clause is applicable but it's not met. Uh, amber means it's applicable but I don't believe you. Um, uh, you know, there's some issues here. 
and green means applicable and it is met. And you basically color the, this column down here. Right. Now, you can use this column for notes as well, which is what I do in the next example. Right. So that's just, basically how it works. That's just just, how just, it works. Pause, just pause there, Ian. So just people yeah. be aware, we, we, we are going to be sending you these slides, so you'll be able to look at this in detail. But certainly, I'm going to be yeah. using this for Mango. Um, <laughs> I'm going to use the same methodology and create a dime for how Mango is going to achieve each of the yeah. clauses yeah. of ISO 9001. So yeah. I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got that tip already, so thank you. <laughs> now, what you've got written here is, so, so, this, so this, this is the numbered items. I can refer to, to items of conformity down here, right? This is clause 5.6 in 9001-2008. And this says, basically, this, this one reverses the sentences. So this says, has top management reviewed the organization's quality management system at planned intervals to, if, to ensure its continuing suitability and effectiveness? Right now, I'll, in, in in my versions of this, there will be a description in here, where so where it's documented, how it's implemented. That'll be the people that turn up to do this, how it's monitored. Somebody monitors it, and where's the where's the evidence? Where's the of, of conformity? Just pause there, Ian. Just no, for a question. Just a question. Yeah. Um, with the new 2015 version, um, you don't need to document all your procedures anymore, or how do you get? What do you say in terms of documented there, where you don't actually need to well, have a lot, the, have a lot of you, it? The, the, it does, yeah, that's a bit of a fallacy. The 2015 standard does actually ask for documented information. Right. Hmm. So I wouldn't change this at all. And for the purposes of, and I, I'm, I haven't done, I've got a client up the road who I'm working through 2015 with, and we're using exactly the same methodology. There are many places in the 2015 standards where it says documented information. Child retain just uses different words. I'm, so I don't entirely buy into this view that the new standard doesn't require documentation. It doesn't require documented processes, and it doesn't require speci it doesn't specify that it wants documented processes, and it doesn't specify that it wants documented procedures. But it does say it wants documentation. Uh, Andy's asking, do you have the DIME template for 2015 yet? Not yet. Not yet. Sorry, Andy. I haven't done one yet. <laughs> um, and, and, and hang on, I've just, hang on I've got to, I've, this is for the sake of the legalists about you. <coughs> uh, copyright actually prohibits me from letting this stuff out because this, is, right. this column down here is all copyright information. Mm, mm. So whilst it's probably okay to do your own, it's without getting a license from Standards New Zealand to release a copy of their standard in this format. I'm not in a position to let you have a copy of my dimes, hmm. if you know what I mean. Yep. Okay. It is a copyright issue. Um, so okay. you have to now whether, whether you when you do your own one, whether you, whether you put all this detail in is entirely up to you. Um, you can just put clause numbering in. My belief is that the more detail on the left, you get better detail on the right. Mm. And what I mean by by one one row per item is this CG562 review input. That's the old A to G. Mm. Remember that in five plus five point six management review A to G. Well, each one of these is a separate point of conformity. See what I'm driving at? Yep, gotcha. Right, now, let's move on to a done one. This is a done one. This is part of my ISO 134851. You'll see what's happened here. And this one's got evidence up here instead of effective. And I put notes down here. That's really, This is a real live one using a, a particular client's um, system. What happens is that uh, where, where appropriate, I, you merge cells just to make it simple. So I, I deal with all of these three points of conformity with these two processes that cover both documentation and implementation. So these, these numbered things here are individual processes. In this particular document, there are hyperlinks that lead me to a, 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 an intranet. Uh, okay, so you can actually merge and combine <laughs> cells together. So, yes, absolutely. So yeah. monitors yeah. and evidence can be joined together. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, otherwise, you go mad. Yeah. I, yeah, it doesn't reflect reality, and the thing has to reflect reality, or nobody takes notice of it. 
Excuse me. So just in terms of inter internal audit, you, you're continually updating this dime to prove yes. that you are internally auditing the system. So you, you do this document Correct. instead of internal auditing, or you do it as I, part of internal auditing. That's what you're... This is my internal audit. This is your internal audit here. Continually yeah. updating yeah. this document is your it's internal audit. Well, you, you don't need to... You don't, you don't need to audit this. You just continually update it on a daily basis. Once a year, I stop and reevaluate it. And a colleague and I reevaluate re re it. We do an annual, We don't need to do that, but we do that because the external auditor can't get his head around any other way of doing it. Right. Not doing it right now because external audits coming out. In our system over here, um, you see this for IR, and IR is internally in this company. It's an improvement report, and so there, there was an issue here that I wasn't very happy with, so I raised this document to fix it. So the output of the audit is this document brought up to date with these improvement requests uh, raised on the day. So there's the output of the audit. So you only update this document annually, is what you're saying? I update it. Um, if I remember, I, it doesn't change that much. But what happens is that these procedures in our intranet um, Get modified and change, and I go back and change them in, right. in here. But so, but once a year, there's a hit the pause button and check it all out, just to recalibrate. Right, and you do this instead of internal. That's a nice Cool. Internal of instead of internal. And, and in fact, yes, it, um, um, instead of internal orders in the conventional way, right. the procedure for doing this is written up in what I call my internal audit plan. Right. Okay. You see, the standard doesn't have any specification for what an internal audit procedure is. Sure. And that's the point that a lot of people miss. Um, okay? Mm -hmm. You can audit how you're doing well like. And the only not in the whole thing is that internal auditors shall not audit their own work. That's it. That's the only stumbling block you've got to avoid. But you can define your internal audit program how you like. So that's why you, probably... you, you do this spreadsheet with another person just to ensure that you're not, so that, that that prevents the conflict of interest where you're not auditing your own work. You're using that other person to verify that you're not, you know, you're not Correct. saying yes, that everything's perfect on the systems that Correct. you look after. Right. Correct. Correct. All right. Does that make sense? That's a good question, Craig. Thanks. Uh, just, just, um, interestingly just, enough. I'll just pause there. <laughs> a very interesting question from Timothy. No, I know we're running down on time, but Timothy, Timothy's asking, yeah. quality versus compliance. Do you believe we audit to ensure quality or to ensure compliance? Uh, you can't audit to ensure compliance because compliance is an ongoing requirement. Um, the standard requires that you check every now and again that you're complying with the standard. But compliance isn't something that you audit. Compliance is something you build in. Um, you audit for effectiveness, right. looking for opportunities for improvement. So you really. look, like you say, you audit for effective management. Okay, keep going. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. So that's how you do the compliance bit. Um, now, how do you do the other bit, the, the, the um, um, effectiveness and implementation, effective implementation? If you've not come across memory joggers, um, I suggest you do so. Um, they're 25 bucks a kick, and they're absolutely superb pieces of, of publication. They've been around since the early 80s. Um, they were invented. They were the gold QPC is the outfit that um, that um, publishes them. Um, they were the first organization to promulgate Dr. Deming's teachings from the early 1980s when he became discovered in the United States. Um, and they were, they were promulgated against the, the, the statement that said, Dr. Deming has been teaching this stuff for 50 years in Japan, but none of it is in English. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting, bearing in mind that Dr. Deming developed it in the 30s and 40s during the war. 
<laughs> you top, you down those ones are wall stops. So here are the these, these, these so there's there's twenty odd tools in here, but the, the key fourteen ones are these. These seven tools here are the standard quality control tools that were the original seven SQC tools that Demi taught on his four-day course. These seven over here come from quality function deployment. And the two I want to focus on is the affinity diagram and the interrelationship diagram, because this is the alternative to internal audit done conventionally. What do you do to run an affinity? As some people know about affinity diagrams, other people don't. But basically what you do is you set up a room, you put up wall sheets that you can stick post-its on, and you get some vivids. You assemble a cross-functional team, that is a cross-functional team, who have experience in the area you want to sort out. You agree a wording of a question. In other words, what are we here to solve? Um, it's important to agree the wording so that everybody has the same comprehension of what the question actually means. This all makes sense in a moment, guys. I just... You then agree brainstorming rules. What do I mean by that? Well, you say one person speaks at a time. There's no such thing as a stupid question. There's no such thing as a stupid statement. Nobody takes the rise out of anybody else. And what's said in this room stays in this room. OK? Now, the facilitator, who I call the internal auditor, and this is, requires a set of internal audit skills that I call now call facilitation. So instead of internal auditors wasting their time asking silly questions around the place, you get them to facilitate discussions like this. And, and the, the point is to facilitate plenty of discussions. Now, you've got a question here, and what you want is answers, single answers written on post-it notes. And the answer has to contain a noun and a verb. It has to be a sentence. What happens next is that the facilitator then, as these questions come out, as these answers, sorry, as these answers come out on post-it notes, the facilitator just sticks them up on these wall sheets anywhere, at random, all over the place. The facilitator's job is to make sure that everybody has their say, and in particular, you look out for the bloke who doesn't say very much because he's probably the smartest. And and you 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 keep going as a as a, when I'm facilitating, I'm always keeping an eye out for the people who are being very quiet. I'm always asking them for their views, and that's oh, I say, I kid you not, I've done this a couple of hundred times now, and it's always the guy who's the quietest that comes up with the real smart stuff. It's really cool. Right, so when the discussion has stopped, and inevitably it does, the, the flow, you get a rapid flow of these post-it notes to start, to start with, and it all peters off. Now, when you, um, so you end up with this white, these sheets of paper on the wall covered in these post-it notes. The biggest I've ever done is 130. And what you do is you say to the group, OK, I want, can you sort them out, please? And they look at you all blank, and you say, "Yes, you get, please. I want you to come round and, and just stand here, stand there, and sort sort them into columns, please. Columns down the page. Right. The only constraint is that you're not allowed to talk to each other. You have to do it in complete silence. And that is the active component in the whole affinity diagram, the sort in silence bit. You might have to write duplicates of post-it notes because people keep moving them around. That's fine. Right. But what you'll end up with Quite might might be you know half an hour later. What you'll end up with is much giggles and poking and laughing. And you know, people thoroughly thoroughly enjoy this. It's a real good call. You'll end up with um, columns, and then you get the group to write summary headers that reflect what each column says. And the summary headers at the top of each column should be such that you could tear up, you could throw away the detail in the columns underneath. <laughs> you don't do that, but that's the idea. You want a summary header that crystallizes what the column talks about. And you end up with something that looks like this. Now, this one was the answer to the question, what are the problems with the current product development process for this company where I was working at the time? And there, there are the headers at the top. They were independent up writing. And there are the post-it notes, right? As they, as they group them themselves, exactly as they group them themselves, right? And so what you've got is, uh, I think there are 13 of these, um, single one-line statements about what they've found is the answers to what are the problems with the current product development process. 
But that doesn't tell you much about the ranking, about how those items fit together. In the internal audit sense, these are 13 findings. Findings. Yeah. Out of an internal audit. Right? Yep. Now what what you do next is that you take those header cards and you put them on a piece of paper in a circle, like that, roughly. That is a circle. Um yeah, all right. Circle enough. <laughs> and then what you do is you agree another question. Now in this case the question was does this header cause or affect the next? And so you start with the first one. You say, does this issue cause or affect this one? Right. If the answer is yes, you draw an outgoing arrow. Now there is an outgoing arrow, right? If the answer is no, you don't do anything. But you do go around the whole lot. So you say, does this one cause or affect this one? Does this one cause or affect this one? And you go right around, all the way around. Do, 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 do. Right? And then you start with the next one. And you say, does this one cause or affect this one? Does this one cause or affect this one? If yes, draw an arrow. If no, draw nothing. And you go right the way around the whole lot until you come back to the star. What you end up doing, of course, is asking, because when you, oh, just make the point here, that when you get to here again, you ask the question, you ask the, precisely the reverse question, you ask, the, in the right. so when you started off, you said, does this one cause or affect this one, and the answer was no, right? But when you got round to here, when you got round to, to that one, you said, does this one cause or affect this one, and the answer was yes. Right? So what inevitably happens is that you ask the question in both directions for every pair of headers. It takes a bit of time, takes a bit of concentration. It sets up discussion like you wouldn't believe. Right? It's, this is real gutsy stuff. This is very, very interesting. It's hard work. It's quite hard work. And it requires facilitators to, um, to really be on the ball. What I do with these is to swap facilitators. I hand the... Uh, I hand the uh, the vivid to two or three people and say you do the next two because um, I, I find it very hard to concentrate that long. Then what you do is you count the in arrows and the out arrows, and then you say, well, the in arrows, the count of in arrows minus the count of out arrows is the scores. The scores will be either positive or negative, and the highest positive score is the main outcome, and the highest negative score is the main driver. So the main outcome, you then lay them out in, in, uh, in a row with the highest positive on the right and the highest negative on the left. This is the prettified, tarted up version of this, uh, this, partic this particular exercise. Now the question was, um, what's wrong with the product development procedure? And of course, right over here, it said delivery is late. Now these numbers are the numbers of the, the header cards around the around the, the diagram. But what you've ended up with is delivery is late is caused originally by inefficient, in, insufficient government processes, which, and then there was a lack of training, and then there was current methodology may not be the best and then office and facilities could be improved. Now I can tell you with this company, because I know this company intimately, that these, th these four issues were dealt with very quickly. Um, they, we went, we, they went back to the governance, the whole governance south side of product development got or a complete rehash. We did some fanciful training on, on uh, just on software development. The whole product development system was revamped and redesigned. We got another issue of the product development manual, and we moved offices. We slowly worked through the rest of it because it actually fizzled out. A lot of it fizzled out, and I can tell you that six months later there was no more delivery problems. So just pause there. So that that those thirteen findings, or yes. that's that's a nice way of summarising thirteen. In a normal internal audit, you'd find 13 
problems and everything yeah. will be there'll be no priority setting or anything like that right. and right. You, you, people would try and do all th 13 at the same time but this is a nice way of summarizing yeah. the findings and but the team yeah. is all involved and I guess the important thing of quality systems is if teams are involved and and it, again it's a principle of quality management is if you've got engagement of people you'll get the change will happen uh, a lot easier when you do want to make change because the people that were involved in this project will be the ones that will will make the change and make the change uh, nice and slick and seamless so that's right that's nice so this is so the dime is your compliance part of the audit yeah. and this one is yeah. the quality improvement part of the audit so, absolutely right so instead of going around with your checklist and ticking off checklist boxes you're actually doing a whole improvement project looking at a particular area yeah, and, that's right. and and solving a whole lot of problems just that's right. with two 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 hour sessions with everybody engaged in the process like that it. was to deal with this one and then and then what we do is that we we call up as a, so we have a very a very healthy team structure with weekly team meetings fortnightly team meetings monthly team meetings yeah. and in each case there, there are agenda items that call this up is there any have we got any problems guys we need to worry about mm. now what it does this kind of thing does it actually breaks down the silos right so our scientists talk to our software engineers talk to our support people talk to our admin people even talk to the accountants gee what? Mm. even they're involved you know, just... <laughs> I've, got, I've, I've got a question here from Dion. It's obviously a little bit confronting this way that you're presenting yeah, here yeah. instead of doing normal internal audit. He's saying, is this webinar on root cause analysis or internal audit? <laughs> What's the difference? It's a smart answer to that. Right. Can't have one without the other. Yeah. So people just seem to do the audit and then forget about it. That's right. Without it making the improvements, so you're saying do the yeah. internal audit and do all the, everything all in that process. Recognise that internal audit is one tool in root cause analysis, and there's no such thing as a root cause, by the way. So oh, anyway, let's, let's, yeah, let's not go on to that. But anyway, we'll well, be we're not going to go into that. Uh, we all week. Um, Any, anyway, keep going. Yes. All right. Uh, so I'm oh, sorry. Yes, that wasn't supposed to be a smart ass remark. No, no. Dion, but I, I think there's, I think it's unfortunate to separate the two root cause or cause analysis and and internal audit. You you use one to check the other, and it, they're, they're mutual. And so basically, in summary, what am I going to say? Well, internal audit came from nowhere. Uh, my fear is that it lets management off the hook, whereas when I was taught my internal or my external auditing in 1984, quality assurance equals effective management. It was we were it was hammered into us during those 52 hours that if you wanted to audit conformity with the management system, you spoke to managers. That was their job. Mm. Right. Mm. And, and, and so I say here, management is responsible for conformity and system effective, period. It ain't the auditor's job. If the auditors are that good, why don't you make them managers? <laughs> yeah, good point. Internal audit as we know it is a peculiar ISO, it's a ISO peculiarity. Other well-known, very effective and arguably more effective quality systems than ISO 9001 like Lean and, and all those stuff and TQM, just don't bother with it. They have they, they place they place their faith and their resource in in education, continual improvement, and internal communications, and making managers responsible. I'm absolutely convinced that internal audit is totally worthless if it adds no value. And we're doing guys too expensive. It's very expensive for a start to take people off duties and get an auditing stuff if there's no benefit. So use it as a tool and, and bend it so it works as a tool. Bend it to identify issues. Bend it so it becomes part of your cause analysis system. And I, I fear that using the semi-confrontational external audit methodology actually hides the potential. And that's the issue I'm trying to, to cover with the whole 
um, this whole seminar, webinar. And I'm firmly convinced after God knows how many years that using fully inclusive team tools it works much, much better. Much better bang for the buck. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that. Thank you. Okay. Kevin, Kevin, Kevin makes an interesting comment here. I knew he would because Kevin always comments on our webinars. Uh, he says, I've been struggling with internal audits all my career and it takes a 70-year-old to fix it. Thanks, he says. <laughs> 70, I'm not 70, Jesus, am I? I You're am. getting close, aren't you? Well, I am here 69, I'm not 70, I'm not joking. <laughs> well, I'm certainly not 70. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. That's awesome. I'm very happy to help anytime. <laughs> this is, and, and by the way, when it comes to documenting your procedures, it's very easy. I, in my um, internal audit procedure where it says in, 2000, in the 2008 standard, you need a documented procedure for internal auditing. I just say, C memory jogger, page doodly doodly do, affinity diagram, page hmm. doodly doodly do, interrelationship digraph. We follow that procedure, which is exactly what we do. It does put the auditors on the back foot, does, so they don't see much of this stuff, unfortunately. But hmm. there you go. Hmm. So that's Very it. Good. Very good. And thanks for Johnny Nash there for his comments too. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> so, Thank you, uh, Ian. That's fantastic. I've learned a heap, actually, and I'm going to use that process for Mango, actually. We're going to do that for our internal auditing instead of the traditional internal or internal auditing processes. So we're going to use your yeah. unconventional process for um, internal oh, auditing. Please. Well, certainly, we're going to start with that. We're going to get that dime underway. Um, I'm going to start that yeah. to I'm going to start that today, believe it or not. And um, well, from actually, Craig, from a project management point of view, it's a damn good thing to do because you because you you well, exactly. do get good progress out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're yeah, definitely we're definitely going to use that as as our key project management tool to to check to see that we're implementing the quality management system yeah. and that right. we're going to meet all the ISO 9001 clauses. So, thank you. And um, well, one more comment for everybody: if you do a dime. You'll find the external auditor will come in and they start to jabber. And they start to jabber at you as though they have a full 100% guilt aged understanding of your quality system. When you get fed up with that, you stop them and you say, right, thank you very much. Which clause are you auditing? Yeah. And they'll probably look at you blank. Yeah, I know. And say, Cause I'll tell you what, mate, if you tell me which clause you are auditing, I can tell you precisely how we meet it. Hmm. Yes, That's very good. It. I'm going to shut up now, Craig. Okay. <laughs> so thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, if you've got any other questions, just send them through on email uh, to me and I'll send them on to Ian and we'll reply to you with those answers. Uh, look out for the recording of this webinar and uh, share it with your co colleagues. Also look out for the slides. I'm certainly going to have a look at those slides and get my dime up to speed. Um, and look out for the next webinar on key performance indicators. That'll be in uh, about three weeks' time. Uh, four weeks' time, I think. That's four weeks' time. Uh, thanks again for attending, and uh, good day to you all. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everybody.